This is part three of the biochemistry of human milk. In part two, we finished up by talking about colostrum. And now for part three, we will begin by talking about the variability of human milk. Breast milk generally has a watery appearance. It can appear even more diluted when a mother has a high volume. The color and thickness of a mother's milk vary depending on the factors we have discussed previously such as time of day, time during feeding, length of feeding, etc. A mother's dietary choices also come into play. I mentioned earlier that breast milk may have a creamy white or a bluish white appearance, depending on whether it was the foremilk or the hindmilk. Milk may take on other tints as well. So choosing green foods like broccoli or spinach or using vitamins or iron supplements with certain additives may result in a greenish shade. The milk may appear to have an orange hue if a mother's diet is rich in vitamin A, be it from a supplement or food-based. Black milk can also be caused by a medication called minocycline. Now these shades may be normal. If the milk appears tinged with pink, a mother should investigate further. This might be caused by bleeding at the nipple or deeper in the breast. The dynamic nature of breast milk is evident in its energy supplying function. Colostrum has just 19 calories per ounce at 18.76 kcals an ounce. Early mature milk at around two weeks has around 20 calories an ounce. And mature milk at around four months has around 26 calories an ounce. And just as a side note, calories can either be written as cal or kcal. And the actual term for calories um, are kilocalories, which is why you'll see them noted either way as kcals or cals. Now let's look into the future, into the toddler years. Um, in the second year, human milk is equal to at least one eight ounce cup, or if we're considering the portion sizes that are appropriate to a toddler, to four ounce cups of milk. Again, this is on average. Some women are gonna feed more and some women are going to feed less. So nutrients that remain stable from year one to year two are protein, lactose, iron, copper, lactoferrin, and secretory immunoglobulin A. Nutrients that increase are fat, meaning energy, lysozymes, and serotonin. And serotonin you've probably heard of, it's an important chemical and neurotransmitter in the human body, and this helps regulate mood and social behavior. It helps regulate appetite and digestion, uh, as well as sleep, memory, and other functions. And this increases uh, in the second year, as we mentioned. Lysozyme, that little enzyme with the important task of protecting us from the ever-present danger of bacterial infection by attacking the protective cell walls of bacteria, increases over time. Now, the nutrients that decrease are zinc and calcium. Now let's look at human milk according to some of the conditions and diseases it offers protection against. One of the most frequent infections of infancy is otitis media, or ear infections. This is a, a nuisance common in childhood, and these ear infections frequently follow a bout of colds and stuffy noses. The middle ear fills with fluid, and eventually that fluid becomes infected, initially causing discomfort and pain. And when I say it's usually in the middle of the night, it's especially in the middle of the night. Recurring ear infections are those that can go untreated can eventually lead to hearing loss. Breastfeeding protects against ear infections in four possible ways. First of all, the many pathogen fighting factors in human milk shield the baby so that stuffed up noses and stuffed up ears are less likely to become infected. Breastfed babies are fed in a more upright position and they're less likely to experience milk backing up through the eustachian tube into their ears. Even if this does occur, human milk is less irritating to the middle ear than artificial milk. Breastfed babies have fewer or at least less severe colds than formula fed babies. Less colds, less ear infections. Breastfed babies have fewer respiratory allergies which allows fluid buildup in the middle ear which allow bacteria to grow. Breastfeeding exclusively for at least four months is widely recognized as the best protection against otitis media. As with other diseases and conditions, the longer a mother breastfeeds, the better the coverage. Additionally, the protection given by human milk lasts. Properties in human milk have prompted the breastfed infant's own immune system to defend itself. 
On a global scale, diarrheal disease is the second leading cause of death in children under the age of five, and it's responsible for killing around 525,000 children every year. Diarrhea can last several days and can leave the body without the water and salts that are necessary for survival. In the past, for most people, severe dehydration and fluid loss were the main causes of diarrheal deaths. Now, other causes such as septic bacterial infections are likely to account for an increasing proportion of all diarrhea-associated deaths. Children who are malnourished or have impaired immunity, as well as people living with HIV, are most at risk of this life-threatening diarrhea. Now, diarrhea is defined as the passage of three or more loose or liquid stools per day or more frequent passage than is normal for the individual. Frequent passing of formed stools is not diarrhea, nor is the passing of those loose and pasty stools by breastfed babies. Diarrhea is usually a symptom of an infection in the intestinal tract, which is caused by a variety of bacterial, viral, and parasitic organisms. Infection is spread through the contaminated food or drinking water, or from person to person, as a result of poor hygiene. Besides safe drinking water, use of improved sanitation and hand washing with soap, breastfeeding is the most simple and cost-effective way to reduce the risk of diarrhea. Human milk significantly increases protection against pathogens that target the GI system, and lessens the severity of diarrhea if it occurs. When compared to formula, breastfed infants enjoy drastically higher protection. Hospitalization rates are 72% lower, while morbidity rates are 77% lower. Another way in which the benefits of breast milk protect an infant's vulnerable GI is by promoting the growth of healthful bacteria in the intestines. Intestines are the healthiest when you can keep the right bugs or beneficial bacteria in the bowels. The helpful bifidous bacteria, which I have discussed, enjoy a symbiotic relationship with us. They produce vitamins and other nutrients and keep the harmful bacteria in check. The ample supply of lactose in breast milk helps the growth of lactobacillus bifidus to flourish. Breastfeeding is ideal rehydration therapy as well. Children who are suspected of having traveler's diarrhea should breastfeed more frequently. In this situation, infants or children should not be offered other fluids or foods or formula that replace breastfeeding. Breastfeeding mothers with traveler's diarrhea should continue breastfeeding and increase their own fluid intake. The organism's that cause traveler's diarrhea do not pass through breast milk. So let's look at the immune system. The benefits of breast milk helps protect babies against all kinds of infections, common and not so common. For example, around 1 million white blood cells are hanging out in one drop of human milk. These cells, called macrophages, which literally means big eaters, consume germs or pathogens. That's only one component of a complex protective system. Human infants receive protection from antibodies through the placenta, but these are gradually used up during the first six months. Think of human milk filling in the immunity gap until the baby's own immune system matures and kicks in. Babies who nurse into toddlerhood receive protection from the many immune factors in their mother's milk. Now, the immune system protects the body from infections and diseases, and it's also called the lymphatic system. It's made up of the tissues and organs that produce, store, and carry white blood cells that fight infections and other diseases. This system includes the bone marrow, spleen, tonsils, thymus lymph nodes, and lymphatic vessels. There are two types of immunity, active and passive. Now, your immune system includes lymph, and that's a clear fluid that travels through the lymphatic system and carries cells that fight infections and other diseases. It also consists of lymph nodes, and these are rounded masses of lymphatic tissue that are surrounded by a capsule of connective tissue. Lymph nodes filter lymph, and they store white blood cells. These are located along the lymphatic vessels. And what are the lymphatic vessels? Well, these are thin tubes that carry lymph and white blood cells through the lymphatic system. They branch like blood vessels into all of the different tissues of the body. So continuing on, your immune system also has the thymus, and this is an organ in the chest behind the breastbone. T lymphocytes grow and multiply in the thymus. The spleen is an organ on the left side of the abdomen, and that's near the stomach. 
It produces some white blood cells. It filters the blood. It stores blood cells and destroys old blood cells. And then that we have the white blood cells. And these are cells made by the bone marrow. They help the body fight infection and other diseases. And as we mentioned earlier, there are many different types of white blood cells. The immune system fights antigens. And antigens are a foreign substance that causes a recognition and then a response in our immune systems. Antigens can be bacteria, viruses, etc. There's a different antigen for every cold you've ever had and every type of flower that's ever made you sneeze. White blood cells patrol the body. When they come across an antigen, they produce an antibody. The antibody binds to the antigen. Each antigen is shaped differently. The immune system has to produce the antibody that fits it precisely. Some antibodies destroy antigens when they bind with them. Others make it easier for white blood cells to destroy the antigen. Breast milk includes extensive factors that offer a baby protection against a wide range of disease and gives lifelong immunities while the bodies are working towards active immunity. The course text has extensive tables that name the immune factor and which pathogen it targets. As human milk protects against infection and inflammation, and early milk is enriched in these immune factors, and these cells help ensure infant survival. So the specific protective components of human milk are uh, so numerous and multifunctional, and science is just beginning to understand their complex functions. Essentially, the cells of human milk transfer living protection and programming. This capability provides broadly powerful protection against pathogens while stimulating development of the infant's own immune system. You'll recognize many of these components because we've you know, been going back and forth. And again, most of the constituents of human milk have multiple, uh, have multiple functions. So you've seen these mentioned earlier in some of the previous functions. So there are the macrophages. Those are the big eaters. They comprise around 90% of cells in mature milk. So they contain secretory immunoglobulin A. Infants are born with immature acquired immunity and rely on maternal antibodies for defense against pathogens. Human milk secretory immunoglobulin A antigen complexes are taken up and processed by intestinal cells, which allow for antigen recognition while maintaining a non-inflammatory environment. And phagocytosis is also present, which is the active destruction of pathogens by the macrophages. Some of the other cells are leukocytes, which we've mentioned extensively before, as well as lymphocytes, which include T and B cells, and those are involved in humoral immunity. There are also epithelial cells, neutrophil granulocytes, chemical mediators, and these actually are secreted by cells in the milk, and injured or inflamed tissue causes more white cells to move into the region to assist in healing and prevent infection. And stem cells are also present. The general methods through which breastfeeding could have an impact on infectious disease are multiple, including promoting mucosal maturation. Uh, the mucosa is a membrane or lining that lines various cavities in the body and covers the surface of internal organs. And so this needs to be healthy in order to function. It also balances the gut microflora. It interferes with the attachment of antigens to epithelial cells. It stimulates neonatal immune systems and limits the exposure to the germs from foreign dietary antigens. A lymphocyte is a type of white blood cell, and we've mentioned lymphocytes before, that is part of the immune system. There are two main types of lymphocytes, B cells and T cells. The B cells produce antibodies that are used to attack invading bacteria, viruses, and toxins. We've covered these before. Immunity to a disease is achieved through the presence of antibodies to that disease in a person's system. Antibodies are proteins produced by B cells to neutralize or destroy toxins or disease-carrying organisms. Antibodies are disease-specific. For example, measles antibody will protect a person who is exposed to measles disease, but will have no effect if he or she is exposed to mumps. There are two types of immunity, active and passive. Active immunity results when exposure to a disease organism triggers the immune system to produce antibodies to that disease. 
Exposure to the disease organism can occur through infection with the actual disease, resulting in natural immunity, or introduction of a killed or weakened form of the disease organism through vaccination, which is vaccination-induced immunity. Either way, if an immune person comes into contact with a disease in the future, their immune system will recognize it and immediately produce the antibodies needed to fight it off. Active immunity is long-lasting and sometimes lifelong. Passive immunity is provided when a person is given antibodies to a disease rather than producing them through his or her own immune system. A baby acquires passive immunity from its mother through the placenta or breast milk. A person can also get passive immunity through antibody-containing blood products such as immune globulin, which may be given when immediate protection from a specific disease is needed. This is the major advantage to passive immunity. Protection is immediate. Whereas active immunity takes time, usually several weeks, to develop. However, the downside to passive immunity is that it lasts only for a few weeks or months. Only active immunity is long-lasting. So mom has spent a lifetime building up immunity to diseases that she has fought. At birth, newborns are abruptly exposed to a wide range of pathogens. Once breastfeeding is initiated, the mother passes on protection. She passes on passive immunity via antibodies in her colostrum and ongoingly in mature milk to the baby. She's already transferred some prenatally through her placenta. So when a new microorganism appears on the scene, the mother's immune system prepares an immune response and it is delivered via breast milk. Mothers offer immunity far beyond common colds and yearly flus. As the baby gets older, they begin developing their own immune response or active immunity. One of the most saddening aspects of formula is the complete absence of protection against disease. Research demonstrates higher death rates for infants who are not fed human milk, and it's estimated that 720 to over 900 infant mortalities per year in the United States alone could have been prevented if human milk would have been the milk of choice. Additionally, the longer an infant receives human milk, the greater the immunity conferred. So look at it like this. There are two forms of immunity, innate and adaptive. Innate immunity occurs immediately when circulating immune cells recognize an issue. Adaptive immunity occurs later as it relies on the coordination and expansion of specific adaptive immune cells. Immune memory follows the adaptive response when mature adaptive cells, highly specific to the original pathogen, are reserved or remembered for later use. It is those remembered adaptive immune cells that a mother passes along via the placenta during pregnancy and human milk beginning at birth. These include antibodies. Many a nursing mom can tell the story of how the entire family, mom, dad, siblings, everybody, coming down with the flu and the nursing baby having the mildest case or not even getting sick at all. So we have been talking about the various beneficial factors in human milk that are transferred to the baby. Viruses also pass through to the baby. However, the possible illness that the baby may contract can be targeted by disease-specific antibodies that are also present in the breast milk. In addition, mothers and babies have generally shared the same space, they've shared the same environment, and antibodies in the mother's breast milk are crafted and they're designed for those precise pathogens that they have both experienced. Any time a mother develops an illness, her body produces a fighting response, and included in that response are antibodies passed to the baby. Even vaccinations the mother received during childhood are passed along. Mothers and babies have, obviously they have close contact, and by the time a mother demonstrates symptoms to an illness, chances are that the baby was exposed during the time that she was contagious or pre-symptomatic. The most strategic and successful option is for moms to continue breastfeeding, so protection via her developing immune response can be transferred to the baby. Any needed medication should be offered to the infant, and mothers who are contagious can continue to breastfeed by using you know, standard sanitation practices like hand washing or, or, or wearing a mask. Rest and following any treatment plan is important for a quick recovery. Name three ways breast milk provides immunity to an infant. So 
It can include promoting mucosal maturation, balancing the gastrointestinal microflora, obstructing the attachment of antigens to epithelial cells, stimulating the neonatal immune systems, and limiting exposure to the germs from foreign dietary antigens. A mom calls you. She is sick and is worried about breastfeeding her baby. What would you tell her? Mothers and babies have close contact, and by the time a mother demonstrates symptoms to an illness, chances are that the baby was exposed during the time that she was contagious or pre-symptomatic. The most strategic and successful option is for moms to continue breastfeeding. That way, protection via her developing immune response can be transferred to the baby. Any needed medication should be offered, and mothers who are contagious can continue to breastfeed by using um, standard sanitation practices like thorough hand washing or wearing a mask. And rest and following any treatment plan is important for a quick recovery. Human milk may increase the protective effect of vaccinations. Studies demonstrate a lower immune response in formula-fed infants, possibly because human milk contains antibodies capable of improving infant antibody response. Other researchers believe that there is no such difference, and others consider that human milk antibodies may neutralize the baby's immune response adversely and lower the defensive effect. So overall, um, however, it is generally agreed that lactation offers present and future protection. In today's age, where vaccinations are controversial to some, breast milk is an immunization that was made to order. It's customized and specific to a unique human. While vaccinations are indeed a one-size-fits-all, human milk is perfectly designed to fit a certain infant. There are additional immunological factors in human milk, uh, and breast milk contains numerous um, constituents that assist in a baby's protection from disease. Again, research is strenuous and ongoing to continue learning about all of the protective advantages, uh, and that even includes rigorous studies in epigenics, metabolic programming, and stem cell function. And we've mentioned these before, but again, there are even additional ones over and above um, beyond what we've covered in this module. Again, this field of study is vast and complex, and, you know, a two-hour module on biochemistry of human milk really is just an overview. It's just an introduction. So just quickly to review, the mucins are glycoproteins. They have a high molecular weight, and they're involved in a number of immune functions. Glycoproteins are any class of proteins that have a carbohydrate group attached to their chain. They uh, may also be called a glycopeptide. And again, these involve shielding the epithelium against infection, regulating cell signals, and gene transcription. Some of the serious pathogens that mucins offer protection against include salmonella, E. coli, rotavirus, and HIV. An oligosaccharide is a carbohydrate whose molecules are composed of a small number, often 3 to 10, monosaccharide units. We have discussed them briefly earlier in the module. They are plentiful in breast milk, and they are a key component of bifidus factor that assists in creating a healthy GI microbiome. Lactobacillus bifidus is the principal beneficial microorganism and leads to newborn well-being. It's elevated in colostrum and mature milk. Not easily digested, these oligosaccharides function as prebiotics, meaning they colonize the infant GI. These are the decoys. These are the decoys that prevent harmful microorganisms from binding to receptors. They reduce the risk for all infection, viral, bacterial, and parasitic. They shield the entirety of the GI system, passing into the stool in the urine. They decrease the risk for necrotizing enterocolitis and also provide sialic acid, which is indispensable for brain and cognitive development. As with other customized components of human milk, oligosaccharides vary among moms and over the course of lactation. They help prevent transmission of HIV from moms to their babies, which is why despite an infant's exposure to an HIV-positive mom, the transmission rate remains low. Mothers who enjoy a higher level of oligosaccharides, um, a few in particular, are linked with low transmission. Oligosaccharides, along with prebiotic status, also enjoy probiotic status. 
prebiotics, again, are natural, non-digestive food components that are linked to promoting the growth of helpful bacteria in the GI. They are good bacteria promoters. Now, probiotics are food or supplements housing good bacteria or live microorganisms or culture, just like those naturally found in the GI. These active cultures help change or repopulate intestinal bacteria to balance gut flora. Lactic acid bacteria and bifidobacteria are the most common types of microbes operating as probiotics. So to obtain more probiotics, you can look to fermented dairy foods like yogurt, kefir products, aged cheeses, which contain live cultures, um, including plenty of non-dairy foods, um, which also have beneficial cultures like kimchi, sauerkraut, miso tempeh, and cultured non-dairy yogurts. Um, are also a way to include or increase probiotics. Ultimately, prebiotics, or good bacteria promoters, and probiotics, or good bacteria, work together synergistically. In other words, prebiotics are breakfast, lunch, and dinner for probiotics, which restores and can improve GI health. Products that combine these together are called symbiotics. And again, formula companies and researchers continue in their attempts to imitate this human milk advantage. Now of all of the antiviral defense factors, immunoglobulin A is most likely the most critical. We've mentioned this immunoglobulin a number of times. If you will remember, these are proteins present in the serum and cells of the immune system and they function as antibodies. This antibody pops up repeatedly when talking about the benefits of human milk. So immunoglobulin A essentially coats the lining of baby's immature intestines, preventing germs from leaking through. Secretory immunoglobulin A also works to prevent food allergies. By covering the intestinal lining like a protective paint, the benefits of breast milk pre prevent molecules of foreign foods from getting into the bloodstream to set up an allergic reaction. Colostrum is especially rich in secretory immunoglobulin A just at the time when the newborn is first exposed to the outside world and needs protection the most. Colostrum also contains higher amounts of white blood cells and infection-fighting substances than mature milk. So secretory immunoglobulin A, as we mentioned earlier, prevents inflammation. It is also active against encapsulated viruses, rotaviruses, polioviruses, respiratory viruses, um, enteric and respiratory bacteria, as well as intestinal parasites. As you can see, it has a wide range of protection. It does not actually destroy or kill them. The immunoglobulins actually envelop and contain them, rendering them unable to attack or attach to receptor sites. And by not attaching to the receptor sites, or the intruding bacteria or viruses or other pathogens do not invade the GI. It also helps stimulate infant manufacture of secretory immunoglobulin A. White blood cells or macrophages, the big eaters, are abundant in colostrum and mature human milk as previously covered. Leukocytes are one form of white blood cells, a type of immune cell. Most white blood cells are made in the bone marrow and are found in the blood and lymph tissue. White blood cells help the body fight infections and other diseases. Phagocytes, granulocytes, monocytes, and lymphocytes are all white blood cells. Looking closely at a lymphocyte, it's a type of white blood cell that is a part of the immune system. There are two main types of lymphocytes, B cells and T cells. The B cells produce antibodies that are used to attack invading bacteria, viruses, and toxins. The T cells develop from stem cells in the bone marrow and destroy the body's own cells that have themselves been taken over by viruses or have become cancerous. Cell-mediated immunity, a specific defense that targets harmful foreign pathogens, are another function of T cells. The thymus is an organ that is part of the lymphatic system in which T lymphocytes grow, mature, and multiply. The thymus is in the chest behind the breastbone, and again, formula is implicated in suppressing the immune system as babies who receive human milk have larger thymus glands. The newborn's intestinal wall is very vulnerable to invasion by foreign pathogens as they have almost no antibodies in their immature immune system. Human milk offers anti-absorptive protection of the intestinal lining, and that's available through many antibodies, especially secretory immunoglobulin A, uh, defending the surface from bacterial invasion. As the infant grows older, the entire GI system, 
including the wall, matures and becomes more readily able to shield itself. The development of the immune system is aided by zinc as well as long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids. It takes longer for a baby's GI tract to mature when fed formula, as zinc and long-chain polyunsaturated fatty acids are transmitted via breast milk. Although breast milk does not guarantee freedom from all food allergies, formula drastically increases the incidence of and rate of onset. Human milk is the optimum way to protect an infant's GI system and immune system through maturation, whether or not food allergies are present. Formula-fed infants also experience higher rates of asthma, and allergies cause approximately half of all cases of asthma. Rarely is an infant allergic to the mother's milk. Rarely. However, an infant may demonstrate allergic reactions in response to a food consumed by the mom. Allergens pass through the mother's milk and may cause symptoms such as spitting, vomiting, gas, diarrhea, colicky behavior, or skin rashes. However, one or some of these symptoms does not automatically indicate a reaction to an eaten food. And this ends part three of the biochemistry of human milk module.